All right, we are starting a new series called Mythbusters. And this would be a great series if you know somebody, a friend or a family member who, you know, maybe they don't believe in God. They, they're at a place where they're saying, hey, you know, I understand what you believe. I respect what you believe. But for me, you know, God just doesn't make sense. Or I want to believe in God, but there's too many hurts and pains in the world today. I want to believe in God, but I prayed once and nothing happened. Uh, this would be a great series for them, okay? Now listen, if you're in here today and you're saying, well, listen, I've been in church a long time. I've been a Christian a very long time. What am I going to learn? You're going to learn how to answer some questions when you're asked about your faith and why you believe in God, okay? So some things that I've heard is, I want to believe in God, but it doesn't answer my prayer. I want to believe in God, but I can't feel him. I've even heard of people who were raised in church. They were grown up in church, and then they had some sort of crisis or an experience in the church world that hurt them. They were offended by church. They were hurt by church. They were judged by church, and so they walked away from God, and they walked away from church, and they say things like, I was disappointed. I was hurt. I want to believe again, but I just can't, and so here's the big idea for this series this is what I want to say, and this is kind of the, the, the picture that I want to paint. I truly believe that people are not rejecting the one and true God. I believe what people are rejecting is a distorted view of God. They're, 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 they're rejecting a hurtful image of what they think God is but they've never actually been introduced to a, the true and living God. That's, that's my heart. That's what I believe, okay? So they're rejecting this restorted, distorted view of who they wrongly think God is. So let me tell you where we're going for the next three weeks. Next week, we're going to talk about the myth of the goosebump God. Have you ever got goosebumps, chill bumps on your arm? Yeah, goosebumps. This is the person who says, I want to believe in God, but I don't feel him. I read the Bible one time, and I didn't feel anything. I came to a worship experience, and I didn't feel anything. How can you believe in a God that you can't see, you can't really hear, and you can't feel him? How could I possibly believe in him? And that's called the goosebump God. We're going to talk about that next week. Part three of this series... We're going to talk about the heartless God. Heartless God. Um, I would love to believe in God, but have you seen all the horrible things happening in the world? How can I believe in a God who would allow shootings where innocent people die? How can I believe in a God that lets hungry children all over the world die when he simply could do something about it and change people's lives? I prayed for something and then something worse happened. How can I believe in a God that seems to not care. We're going to talk about that on week three. That's, a, that's going to be a heavy one, all right? I'm kind of nervous. I'm already shaking. I'm nervous about it. Then the last week of the month, um, one of my dad's friends is going to be here, Jim Bradley, from Kokomo, Indiana. He'll be with us the last Sunday of the month. I will be traveling quite a lot the end of June, the beginning of July. Um, I, so I'm not sure if I'm going to be here every Wednesday or not, but I'm definitely not going to be in uh, the last Sunday of this month. Jim Bradley will be here, but that dude always preaches the house down. He's got good stuff, all right? So let's dive into this today, what we're talking about today. Has anybody in here ever binge watched a TV show? Binge watch, all right? This is kind of something new, right? Binge watching. Um, Back in the day, a, little, a few years ago, they used to call it like a marathon. So Shark Week Marathon. Or my dad used to watch Dirty Harry Marathons. Where he'd sit there and watch all Clint Eastwood movies back to back to back to back. But the problem with that was you still had to sit through all the commercials. Nobody wants commercials today. And I, was even, I was even asked, hey, would the church like to have a spot having a, a television commercial, a paid television commercial. I said, no. Like, why? Because nobody watches commercials. We DVR everything, 
And beyond that, most people don't watch the show the moment that it's aired. The only TV shows that people generally today are watching while it's airing are sports events. Because they want to see their team lose live. <laughs> they don't want to see it in the paper or hear the rerun or anything about it, right? Um, so like pay-per-view events, obviously you're watching that live or a sporting event. But everything else today, we watch on our terms, and we binge watch it. I mean, you could binge watch Law and Order for four months straight, <laughs> right? So this is the idea that I'm going to hit today. We now live in a generation called the on-demand generation. On-demand generation. And it's actually something that the church is struggling with. I'm not saying our church, I'm talking about the church at large, the church universal. We're struggling with this on-demand idea. Because everything in our lives today is on-demand. Even the food we eat is on-demand, right? You can go through a drive through and get it in 30 seconds. On-demand food. I mean, you know, Amazon is great, but you can't just have an Amazon account now. You've got to have Amazon Prime. Because now i got two-day free shipping. And the only reason why department stores are surviving today is because people want their stuff now. They don't even want to wait for it to be shipped two-day air. Or if Amazon comes to Middletown, we could have our stuff next day, baby. We need to pray for that. <laughs> We're this on-demand generation. Everything... We want it when we want it. We want it now. We want it the way we want it, okay? And the church is struggling with this. The church is struggling because we're an on-demand generation. I can watch my show where, whenever I want to watch it, and I can watch it on any device I want to watch it. I don't have to sit at home and watch my favorite show on my TV. I can now watch it on my phone. I can watch it on my iPad. I can watch it wherever I can get Wi-Fi. Or now, you know, you got cellular service to your iPad. You can watch your stuff anywhere. But then church says, we hold three services, 8.30, 10, and 11.30. That's it. Those are the only options you got. People say, but wait. I got options for everything else. How come I have to, I can only come to church in your windows of operation? I mean, this is something that we're struggling with because we are so on demand. Then our views of this on-demand world now come to God. We want an on-demand God. God, I want to pray for something, and you give it to me now. Not two-day shipping. Not overnight. Now. I prayed about it, and God didn't do it, so he must not exist. I don't believe in him. Because God should do exactly what I want when I want it. Are you following me? Yes. Kind of getting where I'm going in this series? Okay. Everything in our lives have become on demand. And when this doesn't happen with God, many people get disillusioned. And they give up their hopes on God being real. If he was real, if God was real, he would be on demand like everything else in my life is. And okay, if he is real, at the very least he's not good. Because a good God would give me what I want when I want it. A good God would do what I ask for when I ask for it, so I can't believe in him. You see, on-demand God is great until on-demand God doesn't work. On-demand TV is great until on-demand TV doesn't work. I mean, that, that's the craziest thing, right? On-demand TV is great until the power goes out. Then we're bugging. Yeah! Now we got to get backup generators to run our house so we can run our Wi-Fi, so we can run all of our devices, so we can watch our shows. Come on, somebody. So maybe this is your story. You might have been a teenager, and you're praying, you're begging God to save your parents' marriage. And you believe it would happen. You believe that God would step in and he would save your parents' marriage and it didn't happen. And your parents got divorced. Where are you, God? You might be a person and you're a giving person. You're always helping other people. You're always giving to other people. Yet, you struggle financially. What's up with that, God? 
I'm a giving person. I'm always helping everybody. But I doesn't seem to, I don't seem to ever get ahead. Like I get right there. I get to even where I'm not in debt, but I don't have extra money. And then bam, something happens and I find myself in debt again. What's up, God? What's going on? You may be happily married and your dreams to have kids and there's tons of pregnant bellies all over the place but it's not happening for you and you're like, we just want to have a baby. How can we have a baby? Everyone else says, what's up God? Where's our blessing? Where's our child? And so often when God doesn't do what we think he should do when we want him to do it, people get frustrated and they assume that he's either not real he isn't powerful, he isn't good, or he doesn't care. He isn't real, he isn't powerful, he isn't good, or he doesn't care. Where is my on-demand God? Did I have your attention yet? We in this? Okay, I'm telling you right now, this is going to be, this is, this is the essence of some of the questions that you're getting about Christianity. How could you believe in this thing when it's not on-demand? We want absolutely everything on demand, so where is my on-demand God? And here's the answer. Here's the answer. Ready? On-demand God does not exist. On-demand God does not exist. On-demand God does not exist. Okay? See, that's, that's the myth. The myth is just because I want something bad enough, God should give it to me. Just because I prayed for something, it's going to happen. Well, not exactly. Not exactly. Okay? I'm going to paint a picture for you as we go on. You got to bear with me because I know, I know some of you are kind of like, all right, what's the punchline here? Kind of got me confused. A very common thought that I hear over and over and over again in conversation is this. People say, Pastor, I want to believe in God. But I prayed that he'd get rid of my depression and it didn't happen. So I can't believe in God. I want to believe in God, but he didn't save my marriage. So I can't believe in God. I want to believe in God, but he didn't do exactly what I wanted him to do when I wanted him to do it. So he's either not real, not there, not good, or he doesn't care. And I'm telling you today, on-demand God doesn't exist. Now don't get upset with me today, okay? Okay. But just because you prayed for something one time, even if you really, 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 really wanted it badly, doesn't mean it's going to happen. Okay? So, I believe that we need to refocus on who we are in relation to God. Who are we in relation to God? In the wide scope of eternity, who are we in relation to God, okay? So we have, to, we have to have some corrective lenses. We need to correct a little bit of our belief system, all right? Ready? Here we go. Big idea. God doesn't exist to serve us. We exist to serve him. God does not exist to serve us. We exist to serve him. And I think the church gets confused when they look at the model of Jesus, well, Pastor Mike, Jesus said, I didn't come to this world to be served, but to serve. So isn't that what God did? He's here to serve us? No. Jesus Christ came to this earth to show us how to treat each other. That's what the whole demonstration of washing his disciples' feet was. It was to show you, hey, dude, take your nasty socks off and wash somebody's feet. <laughs> Help each other out. Be there for one another. Carry each other's burdens. Be there when someone needs a shoulder to cry on. Help each other out through situations of your life. Get together and work on your cars together. Teach somebody what you know. Share your good recipes. Hallelujah. <laughs> Santo. Remember Jesus also said this, it is my mission to do the will of the Father who sent me. It was even Jesus' mission to do the will of the, to serve 
the Father's vision who sent him. That it is our job. I exist to serve God. Okay? That's why I exist today. Let me point uh, this out as well. We are not the main character of the Bible. I looked cover to cover. I never found Mike McKelvey in the Bible. <laughs> Yo, and I looked too. I looked. Mike McKelvey's not in the Bible. Now, I can look at someone else's story. I can look at David's story, and I can look at Paul's story, and I can even look at Thomas's story. I can look at these Bible character stories and say, okay, well, that applies to my life. But I am not the main character in the Bible. God is the main character in the Bible. All right? God is not some genie in a bottle. I'm going to rub it the right way. And by you even knowing that song, you just dated yourself. You're old. You're old. I was told that this week. I'm 39. I was told I'm old. Because I remember pagers. Before they had alphanumeric pagers. If you wanted to say I love you, you had to type 143. Right? You want to say hello is 43770. Hold it upside down. Hello. <laughs> Think it about me. Keep it real. I'm old. I know it. God is not our cosmic vending machine of goodies where we can just go punch in a code and just give me whatever I want when I want it. Now, listen, we do have access. To all the blessings of God through faith. Yes, we do. But that doesn't mean that those blessings come the second we request it. Who? Somebody. Faith. Faith. I'm going to tell you this straight out. Faith gives you access to God. Faith does not give you access to goods. Too many times we want to build our faith and use our faith to access goodies blessings, and we want to bypass God. We want to bypass a personal relationship and say, well, just bless me, though. Bless me exceedingly, abundantly, above all I could ever ask or think. And he says, well, just open up your Bible and spend five minutes with me. I got time for that. I ain't got time for bronchitis, and I got time to read my Bible. I got time for this. But faith is the ability to access God. Access God, all right. Our focus must be in the proper place, and that is serving him. So now that we've established that, then we need to look at what God's role is then. If his role is not to be this on-demand God, then what is it? So the whole point behind this, and my secret goal of this message series, is to help us get to know him better by recognizing who he's not, because everybody in this world are going to try to put their labels on God and say, well, if he was good, he would be X, Y, Z. If he was a good God, then he would be what I think he should be instead of actually who he is. Because what you think is a good God, someone else might think is a terrible God. That's why he doesn't change depending on who he's dealing with. Okay? Now, again, I'm going to say this one more time. I believe with all my heart that people all over the world today are not rejecting who God really is. They're rejecting a distorted and inaccurate view of God. Something that's hurt them. An experience that's hurt them. People in church who have hurt them. You know, more people leave church and leave a religious organization because of other people. And then somehow blame that on God. That's a distorted view. Okay? So I want to talk about a few qualities of the heart of God. If he's not an on-demand God, then who is he? And if you're taking notes, here's my first point today. We need to recognize that God's heart is always loving. His heart is always loving. God's heart is always loving. So if you experience something that is not loving, it's not God. And, and I'll tell you, I think even at, in church, church people themselves have given God a bad name. 
They've given them a bad rap. They go through something and they say, well, God's in control. He's going to work it out. As to say that God made that happen. If it's not loving, it's not God. <laughs> because God is what? Love. He can't operate outside of who he is. He is love and he can't operate outside of love. So if what you are experiencing is outside of love, it's not God. If, if you walk into a place and people are judging you, that's not God. That's people. That's people. That's their own prejudice. That's their own issues. That's not God, all right? His heart is always loving. So I got to paint this picture so that we can clearly understand this. Anybody in here have kids? Okay, parents, okay? Parents, there's one thing I know about all parents is this. There's never a time when you don't love your children, right? There's never a time that you don't love your children. Now, there may be times that you want to punch them in the face. <laughs> there might be times that you wish there was a trade-in program. <laughs> there are times that you don't like them at all, and you say, you better get out my face right now. <laughs> but you absolutely always love them. Listen, I could be so angry at my kids, and one of them falls down the stairs. I'm jumping up, and I'm running, and I'm picking up my kids. Yo, you okay? Good. Okay, I don't like you. But we're always loving. Here's the second thing I know. That's true, right? Am I true? Yes, okay. Here's the second thing I know about parents. I know that there are times when I do not do what my kids want me to do for them, even though I have the power to do it. I don't always do everything my kids ask me. Sometimes I tell my kids no, when I have the power to say yes. Is that true? Okay, so we understand these two things about parenting. You always love them, but there are times that you do not do what they want you to do, even though you have the power to do it. Okay, I'm gonna parallel this. I'm gonna give you a story. My son's on a candy kick. He's discovered candy. He's five years old. And he thinks he's slick. He thinks he's smart. He'll come to me and say, Daddy, can I have just one candy? Can I have just one candy? And I'm like, yeah, Papa, go ahead. You can have a candy. And so he'll go, we have a cabinet that's got the candy. He's got a candy shelf that's organized. And he'll go in and he'll grab the whole bag of Sour Patch Kids. And he's just sitting there, he's eating the whole bag. And I said, Papa, I said one candy. He said, Dad, it is one kind of candy. I said, boy, we need to renegotiate this contract. You're taking advantage of me right now. I say, Daddy, can I have just one candy? Normally I say yes, right? But the, the other day, ready for this? I mean, this is the other day. Daddy, can I have just one candy? Yeah, Papa, you can have a candy. I come into the, into the dining room. He's sitting there with a two-foot chocolate bunny. Sitting there with it between his legs. <laughs> Chocolate all over him, everywhere. I said, bro. He said, this is just one candy. <laughs> but why would I say no to him on candy? Why would I say, normally I say yes, but why would I say no? If he says, Daddy, can I have just one candy? No, you're a liar. You can't have a piece of candy. <laughs> no. One, one reason why I would say no is because I know it's not good for him. He's OD, right? One piece of candy is good. Like the one little tiny piece of candy, that's good. It tastes good. It's fun. It's exciting. 
But too much of any good thing is not good. Right? Dude, you're going to get sick. I have knowledge that you don't have. Come on, I'm paralleling this now. I have knowledge about this situation that you don't have. You're nearsighted. You want a quick fix. You want the sugar high. But I'm telling you, this type of behavior long term is not beneficial to you. The Bible says this. Paul wrote it this way. All things are, 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 are permissible. He's saying this. He said, you can do whatever you want. You can do any kind of behavior you want. It's all, you can all go to heaven, but it's not all beneficial to your life. I'm saying, Papa, no. You already had a piece of candy. It's enough. Said, mm. I want candy. I want a piece of candy. You don't love me. I'm like, wait, hold up a second. You trying to manipulate me? I said, I love you enough, I'll spank you. <laughs> Second reason why I would say no to him, he says, Daddy, can you just have one piece of candy? I say, no, Papa, you can't have a piece of candy. But Daddy, I want a piece of candy. No, you can't have candy. Daddy, I want a piece of candy. Son, I got chicken on the grill. We're going to eat in five minutes. I would say no because I already have a better plan for a better meal. I already got a plan for a better meal. Bro, we're going to have arroz con pollo, papa. Arroz bichuela. Come on, we got the rice, we got the beans, we got, we're going. Come on, papi. But I just want one piece of, I have a better plan for a better meal waiting for you. I don't want you to spoil your appetite. Listen, I love my son. But why would I say no to something that seems good? Because I have knowledge of the situation that he doesn't have yet. And I believe that this is the, many, the same situation with God. Sometimes when you think he's saying no, he's just saying not yet. Let me work something you haven't seen yet. Let me do something you haven't experienced yet. I'm not saying no, I'm just saying wait. Let me give you another example, and then i got to give you a Bible verse to make this an actual sermon. <laughs> you realize we haven't opened the Bibles yet today. It's crazy. My oldest daughter, she's 15. Uh, I beg, hey, KK, you need to do your homework. Yeah, yeah, yeah. KK, you need to do your homework. Yeah, yeah, yeah. KK, you need to do your homework. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's now midnight. No, I ain't. I'm done with KK. It's Betty time. She's like, Dad, can you help me with my homework? It's midnight, Mommy. Dad, can you help me with my homework? No. I'm going to bed. No. I've been, I've been, I've been reminding you all day. I wanted to help you at 3 o'clock. And I wanted to help you at 4 o'clock. And I wanted to help you at 5 o'clock. And I wanted to help you at 6 o'clock. But you chose to ignore the warning. You chose to ignore my voice. Now listen, I'm, I want to. I want to. But this is what's happened with the genera this generation. We've bailed them out so many times. We've bailed out our kids so many times that they now want to have jobs and get paid top dollar for not working. Because mom and dad told them to make their bed. They didn't make their bed, so mom and dad just made it for them. But dad, I'm going to get a bad grade. Then you chose to get a bad grade. I thought you loved me. I love you so much. But I want to build something in you instead of doing something for you. I want to build responsibility in you. I want to build personal conviction in you instead of just do something for you. And listen, I want to tell you this right now. God wants to build a relationship with you instead of just doing things for you. 
The issue is so many times, man, the Holy Spirit is warning us all day. Don't do it. Don't go there. Get away from there. Run. Don't do that. Get away from there. Don't do that. Get away from there. And then the, the poo-poo hits the fan. Where's God now? Right where you left him, on the nightstand, on the back of the toilet. He was there the whole time. He's still with you now. But you chose. You made that choice. Yeah, but if he loved me, watch this. Romans 8.35. Now it's a sermon. <laughs> Romans 8.35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or the sword? Now, let me break this down because... I really don't think anybody's going to get threatened with a sword this week. Let me make it a little bit more modern here, okay? What shall separate us from the love of God? Shall financial trouble? Shall relationship breakdowns? Shall unemployment? Shall cancer? Shall depression separate us from the love of God? So make it real. Just, just, you just got to, see, we got to make the Bible real. Whatever you're dealing with, whatever that thing is that's saying, okay, I can't believe in God because of this. Shall that separate you from the love of God? And verse 37 says this, no, no. Listen, even if you're dealing with cancer, watch what it says right here. In all these things, we're more than conquerors. Even in the midst of my health issues, I'm more than a conqueror. No matter what, I'm more than a conqueror. Through what? Not my own power. It says this, through him who loved us. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And this is where I get amped up if I want to get a little crazy in here today. Verse 38, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angel or demon, neither the future or the past, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate me from the love of God through Jesus Christ my Lord. Woo! Come on, somebody. Listen, it's telling us this. It even goes beyond that. There ain't no bad behavior that can separate me from the love of God. There's nothing I can choose to do that's going to separate me from the love of God. God loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. God is love. So why do bad things happen? Because point number two, God is good and the devil's bad. God is good and the devil's bad. Do you know the devil's greatest deception, his greatest lie, the devil's greatest trick that he's ever invented is to get people to believe that he doesn't exist. Is to make people believe that it's all God. It's all God. It's all God. Now listen, God is good, the devil's bad. God is love, the devil's hate. If I experience something in my life that is evil, that is dark, that is hate-filled, God had nothing to do with it. That wasn't God. Right? Well, if God was good, he would prove his love to me by answering my prayer. No. Incorrect. He, that's more manipulation. Well, if you love me, you'll give me that piece of candy. If you love me, you'll show me he did by sending his only son to die on a cross. That whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God does not prove his love for you by micromanaging your life and doing every little detail for you. He proved his love by putting his money where his mouth was, by sacrificing all that we could be brought into his family. God is good. The devil is bad. For James 1.16 says this. I'm closing with this. Don't be deceived, dear brothers and sisters. 
Now think about it right there. Why did he have to even put don't be deceived? Because it's going to be so easy to be deceived. Watch what he says. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Say, don't be deceived. Don't be fooled to think like bad gifts could come from God. Don't think for a second that God's trying to teach you a lesson by making you sick or hurting you. Don't be fooled by that. that that's as dumb as to say, that's as dumb as to say, I'm going to teach my son not to play in traffic. I'm going to go put him out on the highway right now. Run, boy! That's dumb. That's not good. And that's not loving. I would never do that to my son. Never would teach him not to play in traffic by putting him in traffic. Oh, God's just trying to teach me something. Maybe you're just under attack by the devil. The Bible says that the devil comes seeking to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have life more abundant. That's the God we serve. That's the God we serve. Ooh, he chose to give us life through the birth of his word of truth. Mm, this is what we're talking about here today. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. This I'm really closing this time. <laughs> Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declare the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Okay, so what kind of thoughts do you have, God? And, and most people just stop right there. Well, let's read what his, what his thoughts are. He says, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So he's saying the whole water cycle has a reason why it happens. So is my word that goes forth out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Do you understand what this is saying? That he created the earth to even give us worship. To show how amazing he created us to be. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper. Instead of the briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. Now you just go read that a few times. And it's just a promise to how good he is. These are the good thoughts that he has towards you. God is good. The devil's bad. And I know that it seems so simple until something bad happens. And I'm saying, why, God? Now, I'll be honest. As we're looking at Isaiah 55, this is my last thought. As his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, his ways are higher than our ways, I got to be straight up honest with you. There is just some questions I don't have the answer to. There are just some things that happen in the world that I have to say, I don't know. I don't know. It tells us in the Bible that there are just some things that we will not know until we get to heaven. That we look through a glass dimly. We don't know all the secrets to everything that happens. I don't know why I could pray this one day and it worked and I prayed the exact same thing the next day and it didn't work. I don't know. I don't know. But what I do know is God is good and God is love. That's what I know. And the Bible tells me, preach what I know. And that's what I know. Amen. If you're here today and you came in and, and maybe you're on that fence. You're in that spot where you're like, you know, Pastor Mike, I want to believe, but I want to have faith in a God, but I think this series is perfect for you. All right. Maybe you're at a spot today where you're saying, uh, you didn't give me enough to convince me that he's good or loving or caring. Um, there's a book on the seat back in front of you. We put it there specifically for this series and where we're going for the next few weeks. This book is something that I wrote a few years, I wrote this book 15 years ago and I never published it because I, I never thought that it was good enough, that it was, you know, it never really 
I'm not a writer. I was, remember I was special needs in school. It wasn't something that I could do. Um, and so it sat on my computer for a really, really, really long time. And I thought, these are just some of my thoughts about God and some of the things that I do in my relationship with God and my walk with the Lord. I thought, if, if something could help anybody say yes to God, or if you have a friend that you know might need the gospel message, we believe that is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance, take, take the book and give it to somebody. Maybe have it in your purse or your Bible and you get into a conversation with somebody, you just kind of take it out and say, hey, this might, this might help, this might minister to you. Um, that's, what, that's what the book is in the, in the seat backs for. It's also for someone who wants to accept Jesus Christ today. You're saying, hey, I'm ready to make that decision. I want to step in. Well, we ask you to pray this prayer with us, but take the book too and read it. it. It'll tell you what your next steps are, what you should do today after praying this prayer and in the walk with the Lord. Amen? And so here at Family Church, we believe that we give our life to Christ or we jump into salvation or born again experience by praying a simple prayer. And it's a prayer of faith. It's a prayer that doesn't change um, so much your, your flesh, but it changes your heart. It changes your eternal destination. And it, and it forever makes a place for you in heaven. And here at Family Church, we pray it together. It goes like this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I believe that he died on the cross and he rose for me. Jesus, I accept you now into my life to change me and to make me new. I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that for the first time and you would like to be contacted, you'd like more information beyond this book, there's a card on the seat back in front of you. It has a number that you can text Jesus to and, we, and it's an automated system that will text you back and then put you in touch with one of our staff members to, to create a discipleship program for you. Um, or you can fill out that card and take it to one of the tables in the back. We are, we, we are here this month specifically to answer questions about salvation, about God, about Jesus, about church, uh, whatever you're going through. If you need prayer today and you just need someone to touch you and pray for you, we have people at the tables in the back of this room. You don't even have to leave this room. You go, hey, this is my situation. Will you pray with me? Uh, I need a hug. I need a touch. Whatever it is, we're here to serve each other as the body of Christ. Amen? And finally, the last thing for today is on Wednesday night, during our worship experience, God challenged me. Um, he, he put in my heart something different that, you know, I close out every single message by asking God to bless everything we set our hands to. It's just something that I've always done. And I felt the Holy Spirit kind of say, well, that's great that you prayed it, but why don't you touch everybody? Why don't you let those, those blessed hands touch everybody? So we're gonna close out, at least for this month, we're gonna close out every service a little differently. So if you just stand up for a second, I'm not gonna ask anything too awkward. Just stand up for a second and grab hands with somebody next to you. I'm gonna grab hands at the beginning of the line here and I'm gonna believe that as I pray, we kind of just flows through this human chain. Yep, spin the aisles. Kind of just be family for a moment and, and pray, Father. Father, we come to the name of Jesus. We thank you for this morning that this is a word in season for us. I pray, God, that we were blessed coming in and we'll be blessed going out. We're the head and not the tail above and never beneath. Right now, God, I pray that everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful. God, give us wisdom beyond our years. Order the steps of the righteous. Open doors of opportunity. I thank you for supernatural healing flowing through this chain right now, touching everyone's bodies, that they are healed and whole from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. I thank you for opportunity, doors of opportunity to open. I thank you, God, for financial increase in their homes. And Father, I thank you for salvation in their hearts. God, we bless them as they are coming in and as they're going, that they have safe travels today in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you. Have a great weekend.